This episode of Inside Louisiana Athletics is brought to you by Park Place Surgical Hospital. Hi, I'm Marcel Johnson. Tonight on Inside Louisiana Athletics, series win streaks for both baseball and softball as our Darren Walker sits down with Coach Jerry Glasgow to discuss back-to-back -back conference series sweeps and look ahead to Houston. But first, baseball is on a hot streak. Pitcher Spencer Aaron Getty is here to discuss his great start to the young season. You're watching Inside Louisiana Athletics. Hello and welcome to Inside Louisiana Athletics. Before we get started, we'd like to pass along our condolences to longtime assistant baseball coach Anthony Babineau and head softball coach Jerry Glasgow, both gentlemen losing their mothers recently. So our thoughts and prayers go out to those families. In fact, Coach Matt Deggs will not be here today because he is attending the services of Miss Babineau. But it is my pleasure to now introduce Coach Deggs' fill-in, right-handed pitcher and Friday night starter, Spencer Aragetti, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Um, so, you know, let's talk about Coach Deggs and his absence today because he sits in that chair week in and week out and talks about the team first, uh, playing for each other, doing things for each other. The fact that he's not here today because he's spending time with, uh, with Coach Babineau and, and their family. Just talk about the entire, uh, you know, team uh, philosophy that you guys have? So we operate on the system that we call the pack. Mm -hmm. Like we, we think of ourselves as a pack of brothers. Mm -hmm. Like we, we do everything for each other. We don't care who gets the credit because we know like the only way that we're going to, the only way we're going to play well together is together. And yeah, I mean, coach Deggs is, he's by far the most selfless one of all. Like he, he will do anything for anybody in that clubhouse. He's, servant leader for sure mm -hmm. and like you, you his absence today shows that like he he feels the need to be there for coach bab and mm -hmm. his family because he's family to us too like we're all a family and and doesn't it really kind of translate to what happens on the field you know you see a guy like haney the other day uh who who's got a you know got hit in the face mm -hmm. he's wearing a face mask when he's batting and he's going over a wall going over you know to wall. catch it to catch a, a fly ball doesn't it really translate to the field absolutely. too? absolutely like we got guys sacrificing everything their bodies like guys are playing banged up and it's just because like that's what we need like we need everybody on board every single game that's how we win Let's talk uh, baseball for a little bit you guys go up to Monroe this weekend uh, you get the sweep the win streak is now at five. 17 and 11 overall, five and one in conference play. Uh, you guys, uh, you in particular, got it started Friday night. Six innings, four hits, no runs, seven strikeouts, and your offense really backed you up by scoring five there in the uh, early going. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it help you to go out there with that lead? <laughs> Absolutely, pitching with a lead is always a lot easier. I mean. I don't hate pitching from behind, but mm -hmm. I love when my guys are exploding like that. Like that energy carries over. Like as soon as I go back out on the mound, I just want to get back in the dugout so they can keep doing what they're doing. Like it, it really starts to roll. And like the way that we talk about it is we're spinning the game on them. Like, like it, before they realize it, it's like you said, it's five to zero in mm -hmm. the third inning. And that, that really kills the morale of the other team. And it really lifts ours up. I think it like the momentum and the hustle battle we won all weekend right. and yeah. Saturday, uh, it was a more workmanlike effort, a five to two win. And then on Sunday, you guys find yourselves down nine to two. Uh, but then all of a sudden, uh, a six run six, three more in the seventh. All of a sudden, you're up nine to uh, 11 to nine. Uh, and like you said, you really spun it on, on that one for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like they felt comfortable, I think. Like they started to ease up a little bit. And as soon as that happens, like we're going to attack. That's you got to keep your foot on the gas the whole time. And our guys, like, they took a really good approach going into it. Like, they were putting together really good selfless at-bats, like good team at-bats, which mm -hmm. is something that they really preach to our guys. And, yeah, before you know it, came spinning, like, right. nine runs in two innings. And Coach Degg said something after the game about there, he never sensed any panic whatsoever from the team, even yeah. being down by that much. Yeah, we it's a never say die kind of attitude. Like we're never out of the fight at all. You got uh, you and I were talking before we started here about David Christie and his effort in that game. Uh, you guys were really just looking for somebody to come in and throw strikes and get outs at that point in the game, mm. uh, and he sure did that. Five innings. Um, 
I think he only gave up one hit, one run, strikes out six. Mm -hmm. So when you needed a guy to get in there and shut him down, he really took care of business. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he. We like to call it stopping the bleeding because mm -hmm. I mean, at that point, we had we had seen some things go not so well for our our the, the rest of our pitchers that day. Austin Perrin gave us everything he had to start mm -hmm. the game, but he he was getting hit around a little bit, and that happens. Like yeah. it's going to happen to everybody, but. I mean, a freshman coming in there like that, taking the ball, and like he showed a lot of heart out there. That was awesome to watch. Let's uh, switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about you uh, more specifically. Your first start came on a Tuesday night, February 23rd, against Louisiana Tech. You went six and a third, uh, one hit shutout innings, nine strikeouts, uh, and Cajun Nation got a real taste of Spencer Arrogetti and your your passion and the way you play the game uh and i think you really endeared yourself to to the fans of cajuns baseball what did you think <laughs> i sure hope so i mean that was that was a really special night for me i had been waiting a long time to be able to start a game in d1 baseball like mm -hmm. that and i mean law tech's a really good team like as you've seen they're they're still winning baseball right. games they're beating everybody but i wasn't i wasn't too worried about who the opponent was i was more so just trying to give my guys a chance to win and uh Atmosphere was really good that night. Obviously, I felt pretty good, but I mean, a lot of that comes from my guys in the dugout. Like they were the biggest energy out of anybody, and mm -hmm. I feel like they're, like it's not just me when I'm out on the mound. It's all 40 guys behind me also, and yeah, it was that was a really good night. Four days later, you get the call uh, to start a Saturday game, and you did that for three weeks before getting a Friday night start against TCU. And we'll talk about that game specifically uh, in, more in a minute, but. Uh, just talk about how, in a matter of a month, you go from being a Tuesday night midweek guy to being the guy on Friday night. <laughs> I think there was a reason that Coach Diggs gave me Brandon Young's old number. Um, <laughs> he told me before the season that I was going to start that Tuesday, but that there was the possibility that I could earn my way into the weekend rotation. And right. he told me that I had earned the right to start for them, but that like they still wanted to see what I was really made of. And I think that first Tuesday showed him a little bit of it. I think the next week when I came out of I came out of the bullpen against Rice, I closed that game out and then started the following Saturday against Houston Baptist, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. That was I mean, that was incredible. I'm honestly I'm really glad that they made me earn it and made me prove it because that's what I love to do. Yeah, you certainly have uh by any measure. Um your collegiate baseball career started at TCU, then you went to the junior college route, you end up here. But again, it was that Friday night start against your old team uh, where you went six and two thirds, one hit, one run, eight strikeouts. And obviously it had to mean a little bit more to you uh, to go to do it against that team. <laughs> it did. I mean, I feel like my numbers there when I was at TCU didn't reflect like who I was as a pitcher maybe mm -hmm. at that time. I think that I was definitely a much less mature player when I was there and I wasn't ready for all of what D1 baseball is quite yet, but then I think I answered a lot of questions that night. Like I've been, I've been waiting for that night since the day that I decided I was going to leave TCU. I've told myself that I was going to start on Friday night against them since I left, and that was, <laughs> it was everything I hoped it was. So, kind of reading between the lines here, it seems like you you think that you've kind of you know matured since those days and uh, yeah, absolutely and taken advantage of these opportunities. Definitely, I would say that. There was a lot that I still had to learn mm -hmm. in between my freshman year and now. Really, I had to learn how to pitch, mm -hmm. which was, like, that definitely came probably, I would say, my year at Navarro Junior College. I had a really good coaching staff there. And uh, I'd say since I've come here, I've gotten infinitely better working with Coach BJ. Mm -hmm. He's the best pitching coach I've ever worked with. I mean, the guy's a 12-year big league vet. He <laughs> knows a thing or two about how to attack hitters, right. and he's definitely instilled some of that in me. And... Yeah. Real quick, um, does it surprise you at any level that he's never really been a coach before, and but he's having this kind of impact? Uh, not really. I think once you're around the game long enough, and once you've like played enough, like there's there's not a whole lot that coaching experience is going to do as opposed to playing experience. Like some of the best players make horrible coaches, but he's a fantastic coach. Like, I think it really comes down to just how much he cares about us, how much he wants to see us succeed. And like, you can really tell, like, he's behind us 100% of the time. Gotcha. Um, so 
when your night is over on Friday and now you guys are playing on Saturday and Sunday, uh, talk about your role during those other two games. Are you are you charting pitches? Are you a coach for whoever you know? You see things. You're relaying information to the to the guys who are pitching, or are you just a kind of a cheerleader. What's going on in there with you? I'd say a little bit of all of the above. I mean, some days it's chart day. Some mm-hmm. days it's lead the energy train. Some days <laughs> it's just try to. I mean, like try to help my guys see something that they might not already be seeing. But I mean, 100 percent of the time, it's just it's being behind my guys all the time being loud, bringing energy, like that's what we're all about. Your hometown is Katy, Texas, which is right outside of Houston. So I'm gonna assume that you're an Astros fan, but uh, who were some of the influences maybe uh, when you were in those, you know, little league travel ball, who were you looking up to when you were coming up? Uh, I would say Steven Strasburg, like he was mm-hmm. the biggest name up and coming in baseball right. when I was, when I was like travel ball age. I. I mean, I've wanted to be that, you know, I've wanted to, I wanted to be like a big prospect like that. Obviously, I'm still earning it, still in the process, but I'd say I looked up to him a lot for the way that like he handled being in the spotlight coming up. I think he, um, I would say after moving to Texas, uh, I would probably Justin Verlander, like he's mm-hmm. been somebody that I've tried to model my game after. He, plays the game humbly, does it right, and I mean, he's just really good. Yeah. So I'd say those two are big influences of mine growing up. Not, not, not bad uh, not bad role models yeah, to, not at all. all. Uh, I can't let you go without talking about the hair. Um, <laughs> I know this has been a thing uh, in recent you know, years, in not only in college, but in the majors as well. So, uh, and obviously, uh, it's hit Raging Cajuns baseball now because you're not the only one out there uh, mm-hmm. with the with the flowing locks. I think Nelly's got better hair than me. Honestly, okay, so <laughs> but uh, w- you know, talk about that, where it came from, and obviously, if anybody follows Raging Cajuns baseball on social media, uh, anytime you do something notable <laughs> during a game, our guys uh, in the in the athletic communications department have that that. Uh, uh, the moving flip. image of yeah. you where you're kind of like letting them flow but uh just talk about about that and uh the clip <laughs> is uh that was tim's idea yeah. he tim i mean i couldn't really think of what else to do on the the media shoot day so he was like all right man just wave your hair i guess but uh honestly i just i guess i like it this way right. i would say that's where it comes from and yeah that's, that's about it <laughs> <laughs> at this point I don't really plan on cutting it anytime soon unless I start not pitching very well. Right. So, I had a feeling that that was going to be a part of your answer. Is, yeah, uh, 100%. If things start going if south, they, yeah, if they go south, have... the hair's gone. Gotcha. But yeah, the, I mean, I guess the other part of it, like our our team rules, you have to get a three five GPA or a three zero GPA or higher, or else you have to cut it. So. Okay. I'd say that was another big motivator to do well in the classroom last semester <laughs> just because I really didn't want to cut it. But. Okay, well, uh, this is my last question then. Uh, let's talk about your academic uh, standing, not necessarily your, your grade point average, but let's talk about uh, your major. What are you going to school for and where do you see yourself, you know, maybe um, after baseball? I'm studying kinesiology mm-hmm. and I think I want to train other baseball players when I'm done with it. I want to probably be a strength coach, either that or some kind of physical therapist. It's like helping athletes get back on the field because those people that I've had in my life, like my sports med people and my trainers, like they've been huge difference makers mm-hmm. for me. They've, they're half the reason that I've gotten this far. And uh, I want to be that for like the next generation of players. Like I want to help them develop and maximize their potential. And then for, obviously for people that are like trying to get back on the field, like that's probably the toughest part in sports, dealing with an injury and getting right. back as quickly and like as safely as possible. Mm-hmm. And I, I definitely want to contribute in that way as well. All right, Spencer, we appreciate the time uh, for filling in for Coach Deggs. And uh, it's been it's been pleasure. It's been educational. And uh, best of luck to you and the rest of the Rage of Cajuns the rest of the way. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for uh, Spencer filling in for Coach Deggs, and we hope to have him back next week on Inside Louisiana Athletics. Barnes from the letters deals the first pitch, and this is a drive out to left field. Hollenyak going back at the wall. This one will get out of here. Two-run home run for Tyler Robertson, his fourth home run of the season. And the Rage and Cajuns extend the lead to three to nothing.
Next on Inside Louisiana Athletics, Darren Walker sits down with head coach Jerry Glasgow to discuss back-to-back -back conference series sweeps and a look ahead to Houston. The Raging Cajun softball team still on a roll after a sweep of Georgia State in Atlanta. They are now on the Texas tour, playing 10 games in nine days. And joining us now from the Woodlands, Texas, is the head coach, Jerry Glasgow. Coach, first of all, very thankful for you to take the time out of what is obviously a very busy schedule for you to uh, to talk to us. Uh, thank you. Um, so let's start right there. Obviously, uh, planes, uh, buses, hotels, um, but on the field, uh, you know, you guys are really performing at a high level right now. It doesn't seem like all of this travel and all of these games are really having an effect on how you guys are performing. You know, as a coach, you don't want your athletes to have the easy path. I think there's a lot of advantages of taking the hard path and learning to work for what you get and, and expecting to work and expecting things to be difficult, expecting things to be, you know, um, never easy, overcoming adversity. That's all part of becoming a good ball club, and that's what we're doing at this point in our season. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, the Georgia State Series. In game one, you know, your offense really started to uh, flex its muscles. 13 hits in this one, five home runs. You win it 10 to 2. Summer gets the win, and it seems like it's gotten to a point in the season now where, you know, the opposing pitcher may have some luck against your lineup that first time around. But, boy, once those adjustments are made, the second, third time around that you're seeing them, uh, you guys are really making them pay. Yeah, I think we're getting better at making adjustments and, and starting to approach each at bat with greater importance, um, valuing the opportunity and, and having forethought about how we want to go about the opportunity of an at bat and the opportunity to do things for our ball club. And, and I think our hitters have matured and become more disciplined in the last week or so. It took a long time to get them to the point where they, you know, tended to quit swinging at bad pitches more than they should. You're always going to have a few swings at, at balls that you shouldn't swing at. That's just part of the game, but you can't have it consistently. And, and you want to be that ball club that consistently takes more walks and strikeouts. And I think we're getting better. We're getting better at incorporating a walk into our run scores. Um, and as part of our offense, using a, taking just simply taking a walk as a weapon. Um, it took the ball club a long time to figure that out. And so there's a lot of things that I think we've seen some improvement in in the last, you know, few days and few weeks of games. One of those home runs in that game came from Sophie Piscos. It was, it was her first collegiate hit. Um, last week, Coach Lacey Prejean and I talked about her potential, her the energy that she brings uh, to the field. Uh, comment on... Uh, uh, the way she's played so far, and uh, what do you see in her moving forward? Yeah, Sophie's done a great job bringing energy to a ball club and giving us a really good receiver behind the plate. You know, we go back to UT Arlington where we had 10 or 12 wild pitches in one one game, something unheard of. I'd never been a part of that, never want to be a part of it again. Uh, and it just pointed out we didn't, you know, we had to make adjustments in receiving behind the plate. Um you know, a lot of the balls tipped off catcher's glove and they were created as wild pitches, but, you know, we got to catch those balls. That's mm -hmm. your job is to pick up your teammate. And and so that that was part of the process when we decided to bring her off a red shirt. And we, we wanted to save her for the next four years, but this is a team that we feel like, you know, now is important. And mm -hmm. this particular ball club is, is um, a unique opportunity. And so we brought her out, and she was willing to do that. She wanted to do that to help us. And she's actually exceeded all expectations behind the plate defensively. And then we knew, energy-wise, that's what we get every day in practice. Right? <laughs> we knew we were going to get that when she was in high school uh, three years ago when I recruited her before she ever got to Lafayette. I knew we were going to get energy and uh, a kid that every day uh, create excitement and enthusiasm in your practices. And and getting to see her behind the plate really invigorated our ball club and, you know, been a key, I think, to the season along with uh, Caitlin Allerink going over to third base. I think those are the two biggest defensive adjustments we've made is Piscos and her. Mm -hmm. Justice Mills, Julie Rawls, Melissa Mayu go back to back to back. Again, you win that first game 10-2 to two in five innings. On game two, you relied more on pitching and defense. Kendra Lamb 
dominating in the circle, a one-hit shutout. She faces only one over the minimum. Really easy to see now why you, you've decided to start relying on her more this season. Yeah, I think that, you know, she used the COVID offseason extremely well. Went back to Australia, worked with Jim Smith, a great Australian pitching coach. And, she, you know, she came back vastly improved in the fall. And, and it didn't translate immediately in gameplay. But then you started to see that glimpses of, of potential um, greatness there in early in the early January scrimmages. And, and she just continued to get better. And this last couple of weeks, is, she's really been off the charts good in the last two, three weeks. Game three on Saturday, a complete domination in just about every area, 13 to one. Home runs from Tally, Jade Gutierrez, Bailey Curry, two from Julie Rawls. And I want to talk about her for a second because just a week ago, uh, you know, it was a big question mark on, on that thumb of hers and whether she was going to be able to uh, push through it. Uh, she is performing at a very high level now. So my question is, has, has the thumb gotten better or is she just pushing through this and, and really uh, performing at a high level? Yeah, she's definitely pushing through and still playing in some discomfort, but a lot less. And then, you know, we, the doctors tried different treatments and we finally got a treatment that worked. And uh, that really some relief and, and they found a better splint for her. So just a lot of things, uh, you know, uh, tolerance of pain on her part and, and the ability to endure adversity and the pain on the receiving the ball. And then also great work by our medical staff, you know, to really find, find ways to help her get back with that. The splint that they made for her thumb is really, really a key in that whole process and, and tip our hat to, we got great medical people behind our uh, in our back pocket, so to speak, for sure with them. For sure. Some unsung heroes, no doubt. The doubleheader on Monday, you go to Lamar. A game one, you win at 18 nothing. Julie Rawls with another home run. It was her fourth consecutive game with a home run. 11 players with a hit in this one. You win game two, 10 nothing. Uh, so in the doubleheader, you had 27 hits, 13 of those for extra bases. And I know you love that because uh, most of the time, those extra base hits are directly resulting in runs. Yeah, it's a very deep pitch. And, you know, we hit the ball very well. Uh, the fences are 235, I think, in center or 230, 215 down the line. So it's a, a bigger ballpark than most ballparks. And that really plays well to our team because you know, we're very fast in the outfield on defense. So the big park is an advantage for us. And then we're, we're pretty fast on the bases. So we were able to get a lot of triples. And uh, it just, it really was a fun night as far as the performance of the athletes. You know, we had some great performances. Kendall, Kendall Talley, I think, got hit five times and just took it uh, really tough. Showed some great toughness. And um, you know, I don't know how many, I think we got hit like 10, 12 times. If it had been baseball, it would have been, it, it would have been a, uh, for all probably <laughs> because we just absolutely got beamed way too much and right. umpires for whatever reason never addressed it and we didn't complain we just let it happen I guess and uh, uh, but I think that's all part of showing our toughness as a ball club and you know uh, it was a, it was a performance that in a lot of ways um, was indicative of improvement on our ball club and in other ways it was just you know a night where one team was far more talented than the other. Right. Sierra Bryan has reached base in every single game this season. She still has a long way to go to catch Kara Grimion, who has, uh, whose mark is 47. But uh, can you just sit there uh, day after day and watch her continue to get on base? Uh, are you amazed a little bit? Uh, because, look, everybody has a, a bad day once in a while, and, and it just doesn't happen. But, but she makes it happen. Yeah, I'm very proud of Sierra, you know, and honored that she chose to be on our ball club this year. And she's a kid that in seventh grade, I recruited her to the University of Georgia and SEC school. And, and we developed a, a good bond, you know, a good, a good friendship and uh, a bond, I guess you would call it, in those seventh, eighth freshman year in high school. And then, um, to get her here and get to watch her play her last year of college softball and see her have the kind of amazing season that she's having is it's really been fun for me and one of the highlights of our season for me as an individual. Um, and nothing she does surprises me. She's just enormously talented. 
extremely focused. You know, I think a lot of people notice how talented she is, but they don't notice how focused she plays the game and the um, a talent that she has to, she really studies the game. She studies the pitchers. She, she knows how to get in a quiet place and how to operate uh, while at the plate uh, in a very efficient mental manner. And I think, you know, when you have all the tools physically and a great mind and a great intelligence about the game, that it's what sets up that uh, enormous success that she's having this year on the field. Uh, did not, the news was not all good coming from the week. Uh, All-American shortstop Alyssa Dalton with hand surgery. Uh, she is out indefinitely. And then yesterday, uh, Frankie Izzard rounding third base, uh, had a lower leg injury, pretty significant. Um, so, again, the news was not all great, but there may be some light at the end of the tunnel uh, looking at towards the end of the season with two previous injuries. I mean, how do you kind of wrap your head around having such, I guess, significant injuries? Uh, this is not a, a, a usual thing for softball. Yeah, I think the, the mindset has to be, you know, we want to, you know, obviously we feel great sadness for our teammates and, and our student athletes that, you know, give everything they can give for our program. When you go down with an injury like that, you know, you, you've left it all on the field. And so we, we want to, you know, celebrate that, acknowledge that, mourn for them in that sense, or feel feel sad for them, um, appreciative of them. But on the other hand, we also want to honor them by uh, continuing to fight and to play at the highest level we can possibly play. And we still have an enormous amount of talent on our ball club. We we knew coming into this year we had enormous amount of depth. We knew that it was a year because of COVID that we would need that depth at some point. Uh, we didn't envision the injuries that we've had, um, but we still have to recognize like we, we're, it, we're uh, one of the most talented teams in America, even now. And the only way you can honor those teammates correctly is to go out with great focus, with great fight, with great effort and great performance. And, and when we do that, we'll be, we'll be doing what they would want us to do and we'll be honoring them in the correct way. So that's our goal. Um, and it's going to take mental toughness to to put everything aside and go out on the field tonight and tomorrow night and this weekend and the rest of the season. It's going to take enormous focus from our ball club and our coaching staff um, to do that. But we we've got to have great resolve, and I think we'll 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 try to accept that challenge and and make the most out of what we do. I know you still have work to do this week before the weekend, but obviously uh, this weekend series with Troy is huge. They are 25-6, and 9-0 and in the Sun Belt. They have six players hitting over 300 and quite a pitcher in Leanna Johnson. She's 14-3, and three, number three in the country in strikeouts, uh, 1.19 ERA. Uh, last question, uh, obviously uh, it's just going to be a big series this weekend uh, moving forward. Yeah, it'll be an extremely important series for Sunbelt. The, the Sunbelt Conference is going to really have a major week this week with Texas State playing South Alabama. I think Troy and Texas State play tomorrow night. And then, of course, we play Troy this weekend. So these games this week are enormously important and, and will have a serious impact on how the Sunbelt unfolds as we go down the wire. All right, Coach, again, we appreciate you taking time out of uh, what is obviously a busy schedule for you guys. Best of luck this weekend, and we'll look forward to having you back in the studio next week. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Inside Louisiana Athletics. Be sure to catch us next week for more Louisiana Raging Cajuns coverage. Go Cajuns.